to the cloud. This is to the cloud way up there in the sky somewhere. But we got to get back down to earth to have class. Even though it's in Zoom, we're still planted here physically on earth. We're not talking to the space shuttle flying above. Not yet. And yeah, we don't have a direct connect. Uh, but Tiagi might have the, the, the connections that he could provide for us. Uh, this week, we have a real pleasure uh, for our R511 introductory class in, in EdTech Foundations. We have Dr. Tiagi with us live from far reaches of the world, Bloomington, Indiana, no less. Uh, we've, we've got, you know, I don't know how we were able to get someone from, from that great place of Bloomington, Indiana, but we did. And so we have to take advantage of that. And so um, I've known Tiagi since I got to IU because everyone said, have you met Tiagi yet? When I arrived, have you met Tiagi yet? I was just, I was helping take the tape off the elevators when I arrived. There was a brand new building school of ed and I'm taking the tape off it. Have you met Tiagi yet? Oh no, I, I'll, you know, meet him. Oh, you got to meet this guy. So I did have lunch with him many times at Mark Pie's China Gate, which no longer exists. Uh, and I've presented with him at N the Nasaka conference and at the ISPI conference a couple of occasions in San Francisco and in Bloomington and other places. And he is one I've stole many ideas from. If you have my new book, Transformative Teaching Around the World, we have 42 chapters of people who use my Saturday class content, which is basically Tiagi stuff on creativity, critical thinking collaboration, and so forth. And I sent you a link to Lola, his newest book uh, that's available for us privately in Dropbox. Uh, uh, learning activities, learning online, something like that, Lola. When I grew up, I knew Lola as a song from the Kinks, but uh, and yeah. Chris remembers that song as well. So I'm not sure if he named his book after a rock group from England, but maybe that has to enter his mind for a little bit. So I've known Tiagi for, from, from the standpoint of getting feedback on my own books, including the Adding Tech Variety book that I did with Elaine Co, who happens in here tonight from New Zealand. Thank you, Elaine. Um, and also I sent him my most recent book on um, that, that, that expands it into the area of, of English education and so forth. So I came out with Dr. Frida Powen a couple of weeks back. But the newest book, uh, Transformative Teaching Around the World, is really, really is stealing his ideas. He's got thousands of ideas, not hundreds of ideas, not one, I, thousands of ideas to, for edit, innovative pedagogy. And so, um, gosh, there's there's so many good ones. But the 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 one where you get everyone to to say whatever in two minutes or less, the 99 second reflections, uh, is one I've used all the time. So, so we'll talk a bit about pedagogy, actually. But Tiagi, did you, you said you prepared something to share with us, or or do you want to just have a Q and A tonight? Yes, and yes, yes and yes. Okay, yes Q and A. Yes, he's prepared something for us, and I'm jealous. He's got an Indiana red shirt on, and I brought a couple of shirts down with me. I'm going to change into one of them while he's talking. Um, so, Tiagi, you want to first off just um, tell us why or how. Uh, IST found you and why or how you found IST it might be a good way to start us off with a little history lesson because everything springs from that moment, I believe, in your um, transitions from India to the US. So you want to give us a little background? Sure. By the way, thank you. Thank you, Kurt, for inviting me and a lot of things I know I learned from Kurt. He is modest and he actually taught me a lot of things. And you will see that there is such an overlap between our skill sets and our knowledge base, and most importantly, our philosophy of instructional design. Our philosophy of instructional design is don't do anything. Okay. Um, I was teaching high school physics back in Chennai, in India, in a classroom of 50 people. And I started doing some homegrown instructional design and wrote up 
a programmed instructional manual on the chemistry of chlorine and sent it to random people. And one of those copies went to somebody in New Delhi and he said, that is an expert in programmed learning who is coming to Chennai to hold a workshop for teachers. And I'm hereby giving you a free registration and to go to this session. So I went to this session. It was a one day long course. And at the end of the day, I told the workshop leader that it was a good workshop, but one of the researchers he cited was actually a replication of a previous research done by somebody else. And he thought I was being a smart aleck. And they said, if you turn to page 64 of Tabor, Blazer, and Schaefer, Program Learning and Teaching Machines, you will see a short description of the original research. And he rolled his eyes. And a week later, I got a cable from him saying, you're right, I'm wrong. Would you like to be my research assistant? And he was actually a professor of psychology in Indiana University psychology department. So I cabled back and said, how much does it pay? He said, $80 a month, <laughs> which was some 400% increase in the salary I was making as a full-time teacher. So I sold my wife's jewelry and picked up our little kid who was 18 months old, jumped into an airplane and ended up in Indianapolis. Dr. Douglas Elson, who was one of Skinner's colleagues, was the person who got me here. And then he looked at me and he said, hey, you can do a doctorate in psychology, but the money is in the media. They have a new department called ISD or IST or something like that. Why don't you get a assistantship there? And that is how I ended up doing that. And by the way, the first course I took, one of the first courses I took was R511 in those good Hi. old. This class, this class. This class. With, with Dr. Michael Melinda, possibly? Working mm -hmm. on that. <laughs> hey. No, not Dr. Michael Molanda. He was not even born. No, he was not <laughs> here. I had it from Oli Larson, oh. Mendel Sherman, the original founder. By the way, I don't want to confess this, but I came to Bloomington in 1967, far before many of you were born, definitely before Christopher was born. So that concludes the history. <laughs> oh, there's much more history than that, but, <laughs> but we have to move on to some yeah, other things. Exactly. Yeah. This is what I'm planning to do. I have an approach, instructional design approach called the agile improv approach. I make a detailed plan, minute by minute plan, on exactly what I'm going to do. For example, in my plan, it says at 7.14, make a spontaneous comment. It is 7.14 now, and that was spontaneously done, so I can check it off. So I do this agenda, this design, and then I crumple up this piece of paper and forget it and live dangerously. So the content I'm going to handle, I don't know what it is. I'm going to give it to you. You tell me what you want me to explore. The methodology I'm going to use 
is what they call LOLA, live online learning activities, which is my approach to handling the fact that all my clients nowadays want things to be done in Zoom classroom, in virtual classrooms. How can we use the approaches which we used to do, which I learned from Cut Bank? How can we do instructional design and make the variety of things that we are capable of doing in a Zoom classroom? And that is what I'm going to be doing. I'm going to be using things I'm teaching other people to use. So I'm going to shut up activity number one. Uh, here is so, what, oh, go ahead. No, I'm just saying, I see Jennifer Park showed up and I know she's been wanting to meet you. So I'm gonna have Jennifer put her camera on, she's willing and uh, jump in with a question uh, based on her career, a very extensive one for a young person in the field. Jennifer, are you with us? Hello, Hello, Jennifer. How are you? Hi, how are you? <laughs> I'm fine. Welcome, welcome. Wonderful. Nice to see you. So, Jennifer, okay. tell them what you've been up to. Hey, what what your dissertation, your job <laughs> hunting, all that stuff. What 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 complexes you right now? So. <laughs> um. Yeah, um, I think many of you that joined last last week's session uh, recognize me. I'm a fifth year doctoral student in the IST program. Um, I defended my dissertation um, in February um, and my topic was uh, looking into the relationships among um, sustainable work environment, human agency, innovative behaviors and openness to change um, in a a Korean corporate context. So I uh, researched five large conglomerates um, that are um, putting effort into flattening um, the hierarchical structure of the organization. And um, I looked into the, the variables that I discussed um, um, during COVID um, and, um, and looked into how uh, they are um, putting effort into, um, you know, flattening the organizational structure to promote um, um, organizational members' innovativeness and openness. Yeah. So Tiagi, um, based on that, you know, she's looked at like a Korean company, five large Korean companies dropping last names. They're using first names, right, Jennifer? And no more Mr. or Sir or all this what uh, you're in the corporate space have you have you worked with companies that are trying to flatten their hierarchy and what kinds of things they're adopting and doing i'm going to ask dr jennifer to give us the correct answer a part of me you'd like me to share findings with you or uh, I respond to kurt's question Oh, um, <laughs> Kurt, what's your question? <laughs> how are the, how are those five companies flattening the hierarchy? Oh, okay, yeah. Um, so so five um, five companies had different you know initiatives that they are you know um, that they have implemented for the past you know five years, um, and one of the key things is that they no longer see the importance of keeping the hierarchical structure, um, especially during, you know, um, the time of change and where like everybody needs to really step up um, and be innovative, be open to changes um, and be really flexible to, to keep up with the rapidly changing work environment to survive, you know? Um, so, the, because these conglomerates are really traditional companies um, in Korea, very large, and it was inevitable for them to have this hierarchy. Um, but now they are um, noticing that um, hierarchy, the hierarchy is actually hindering 
um, them to become more innovative. So some of the things that they have implemented is really getting rid of the um, job titles. So um, in Korean companies, you would call by their job titles, like, like manager Park, you know, <laughs> like VP Kurt, you know, not a VP, VP Mr. Bonk, something like that. So they are like dropping everything and just calling them by, you know, maybe not by their first names, but by like using, you know, like just by their names um, and not by their titles. And um, having that hierarchy um, in the organization, they also had like this structured pay, pay structure based on their level of seniority. And that has been hindering people to step up or be, or be more, you know, doing more than what they are required to do. So they are internally getting rid of that. So whoever, so you can be promoted from an entry level position to whatever senior manager position in like three years or one year or whatever, if you have the ability to, you know, do it. And that is a really uncommon thing. Like you have to work like 20 years to reach that point. And that's how it worked, you know, like for the, for what, like 30, like 50 years. Um, in those companies, uh, but they are gradually making changes and it's a huge thing. I mean, a lot of startups are doing that um, in Korea as well, but for big companies like, you know, like Samsung and, you know, you know, the, those big companies, it's kind of difficult um, because they had the culture for such a long time um, and, but they are making changes. So I think it, it was an interesting context, especially during COVID, because a lot of uh, those, the select five companies have implemented, you know, those initiatives to flatten the uh, hierarchy. Thank you, Jennifer. In terms of flattening the hierarchy, uh, I work for organizations which are not huge, big hierarchical structures, which is a bunch of independent contributors who get together. And one nice thing, comparing what is happening in India and what is happening in the United States, what is happening is the older, senior, hierarchically higher level people are discovering that capabilities are outmoded and the younger, newer employees, the new hires have more usable, useful, sellable, marketable skills than they do have. And they continue trying to push younger generation around and the younger people seem not to give a damn. And uh, if they don't have something they can do, they go talk to Natasha and get a job in Ogadogu in some strange place. So uh, whether we want it or not, the world is getting flat. Maybe you should write a book called The World is Flat. World is getting flat and things are going to change. There is no stopping them. Random thought number 87. Yeah, I, I tried my hand at writing a book like that, but it, it's, it stopped at the world is and I filled in a different word. Um, ah, so good. Um, so good. Chris is going to be leaving us in a couple minutes. I want to go over to Chris at who was at Indiana Wesleyan, who's now at Johns Hopkins University, working remotely from Indiana. So, yeah, Mr. Yes. Kagi, thanks for joining us this evening. Uh, my question to you is, what do you know now that you wish you knew when you started your career? One of the things I know now is I should not be making any assumptions, including I should not be making the assumption that the assumptions are bad. And here is what I'm going to do. Rather than talk about it, I'm going to do a cognitive psychology experiment. I want one of you, any of you to volunteer. Who wants to be 
my guinea pig. You've got to take Chris since he asked the question. No, Chris is too smart to find okay. it. Somebody else, someone <laughs> want to volunteer. Tina, how about you? Yeah, I can do that. <laughs> Good. Do you like playing cards? Um, I'm not that into I'm not too knowledgeable with it, but yeah. Wonderful. We are going to teach you. How many cards do we have in my hand? Two. Two cards. What card is this? Um, Clover Joker. I mean, not Joker. Okay. I don't even know the name. <laughs> That's okay. Joker sounds good. The yeah. Joker of Clover. Clover Joker. <laughs> what card do you think this is? <coughs> Just guess whatever number and shape. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Guess. Um, diamond five. Diamond five. Wonderful. Almost to close, but not correct. <laughs> it is as a space. I'm going to take away the as a space because I don't like it. What card is this? Um, Clover Jack. No, I took the Clover Jack behind me. This one is as a spade. Okay, good. She is psychic. She did a wonderful thing. And here are some assumptions we are making. We are making an assumption if this is as a spade, the other side should be the back. And if this is the back of the card, the other side should have something. No, oh, it's under the back of the card. We assumed that a card which has something printed, the other side should be the back. We assume if we see the back, if it is turned over, it should be a print. No, the biggest thing I learned, Chris, is you are the easiest person to fool. You can fool yourself much better because you make so many assumptions. And every day I keep asking myself, what assumptions am I making today? And what will happen if I get rid of it? The end. For example, one of the assumptions I'm making is 511 is a useful course. So if I get rid of it, I will probably find happiness. <laughs> Thank you for the question. Thank you. Other questions? By the way, here is another assumption I'm making in conducting LOLAS. I don't talk unless somebody else talks. I do have a question. Oh, uh, good, good. Yeah, and it's in part because um, you were describing your your path in life or your 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 early path in life. And then, and then Dr. Bong said, well, now let's move on to more, more, to other things. But I'm actually really curious if you wouldn't mind sketching a little bit about, you know, where your career has taken you. Um, because we did hear last week about how inspirational you've been to, to, to people around you and how you've helped to start their careers. And so it'd be very interesting to hear. And of course, you said that you at one point headed over to Liberia and how that fit in all of that. I would love to hear. Wonderful. Suggestion number one, don't believe anybody who says this is Tiagi. I'm a total schizophrenic, so whatever other people say could be incorrect. So I came here in 1967, and in 1970, I got my PhD. Then it suddenly dawned on me that everything I learned in the courses are totally useless when I went looking 
to get some consulting gigs. So that is when I decided that is more to instructional design. The primary instructional design, according to my dissertation, is there is a person on top of the Himalayas, the subject matter expert. Nobody is permitted to talk to him. You got to be an ISD graduate to be able to do that. So you trudge up the mountain, sit at his feet, and write down everything he says on whatever topic it is. It could be algebra, it could be zoology, it doesn't matter. The subject matter expert knows everything. And then you carry all of your notes down the mountain and you create your instructional package. And to create your instructional package, the most important thing is it should be in a three ring binder. It should have 687 pages or more. The pages must be repetitiously redundant. It should say stupid things like project transparency number 81. By the way, kids today, they don't know what a transparency is. So it will say project transparency number 81, expose one bullet point at a time, explain its significance in your own language. However, do not deviate from the following script. And then I package it, give it to instructors who deliver it, and the goal is the instructors do not deviate from it. And after looking at how people learn, it suddenly dawned on me, the only person who learns in the systematic instructional design process is the instructional designer. The subject matter expert does not learn anything new because he is arrogant and he thinks he knows everything. The instructor does not learn anything new because it's just a transmitting medium. He takes stuff from the three ring binder and sends it to the learners binders. The learners don't learn anything new because those days they turn the illumination off in the room and the instructor mumbles in the background and the learners have a great time because my study is indicated after four minutes of this type of instruction, everybody starts having sexual fantasies. So dim light, somebody talking in the background. So that is what is happening. And then it suddenly dawned on me, if the instructional designer is the person who is learning the most, why not make everybody an instructional designer? Why not make the learners design instruction, teach each other, evaluate each other, assess their learning, and to do things of that nature. So it suddenly dawned on me, the most effective teacher, most effective trainer is the laziest trainer. Don't do anything. Let the students do all of the hard work because people learn only when they are doing the hard work. That is what occurred to me, except when you tell your client, I'm going to let the students do all of the learning by themselves, they don't pay you. They want to know why they should pay you. So I said, I will have to do a needs analysis. Then I will have to do a task analysis. I will have to do a system analysis and things of that nature. And I did some work at Indiana University using what used to be called the soft money. I wrote some proposals on doing instructional design for teacher trainers. And so that is how I started. 
And three years later, I said, the college higher education setting is limited. Let me go see the real world. And one of the real worlds happened to be out there in Banga, Liberia. So there was a project funded by USAID. And I was always on soft money. That is why I haven't become rich like Kurt. I'm just a starving kind of a person. I'm going to return this t-shirt and get a refund maybe. So uh, the people I work for include USAID, World Bank, and UNHCR, uh, UN High Commission, High Commission for Refugee Resettlement, and the people like that, but also companies like IBM, AT&T, Accenture, all kinds of companies. And I have never worked for a long period of time. I just go in and do something and I measure my success and how quickly will I be able to get out of that assignment and yet make sure the new techniques I taught the people are still being used. So that the story of my life. I got four observations from that. So if you're looking at the syllabus for R511, he just walked us through weeks five, six, and seven, next four, five, six, and seven from behavioral approaches to more open-ended ones. Good. And uh, you know, he, he basically summarizing them in a nutshell. He also talked about what John Graves talked about last week. And John Graves was a student of Tiagi's. There was in sessions of his um, where he says he's he's no he's infrequently on long assignments. So this is consulting opportunities are short term. It could be one day, could be one hour, could be a couple of days, could be a week and so forth. It's a constantly changing notion. Um, the third thing, Tiago, you talked about way back uh, earlier in the session was working with someone trained by Skinner or, or who had worked with Skinner. I was at West Virginia before I came to Indiana and worked with, the, mm -hmm. with, with Skinner's daughter and son-in-law. So we have a connection that way. And I got to talk Who to Skinner. Uh, on the phone, actually, before he died. The fourth thing, he mentioned the Addy model and task analyses and design and, and all this design development, all this. If you give people an acronym, if you give people a methodology, if you give them a term, a label, uh, you can say, I'm doing a SWOT. You know, I'm going to do a SWOT analysis. You, mm -hmm. In the consulting world, you move from getting paid nothing to getting paid $20,000 a day just by having this one technique. If you learn some of these techniques, whether it's a SWOT analysis or, or something else, you can then hang out a shingle and start doing SWOT analysis so your, you know, your, your hands go blue and so forth. And you, you, you can, uh, so people are impressed by that kind of thing. But what, what he's also saying is that it's not the SWOT analysis, it's not the, the Addy models of the world that's making a difference in corporate training settings. And the ultimate thing is, is empowering people. But it's hard for corporations to wrap their heads around the notions of empowerment and autonomy and being uh, employee centered in it when we've gone from hundreds of years of being very top down as, as Jennifer pointed out in her research. It's a difficult thing to try and change, but it is happening. Both Jennifer and Tiago were mentioning younger people no longer put up with this and there has to be alternatives and those mm -hmm. alternatives are appearing. So there's it's, it's the right time for Jenner to, for to do her dissertation and to, to move out. She's got a job at UNC Wilmington, a, a tenure track job, by the way. So she'll be moving on. So uh, a round of applause for Jennifer. So as I'm chatting away there, does anyone have a, a follow-up or a comment or a question that they wanna, wanna have addressed? Yeah, Priska who's in our fashion, the fa our fashion person from Miami, uh, right? A community oh. college in Miami, is it? Miami-Dade? Miami-Dade College, yeah. Okay. 
Um, so the question I had was kind of, I was very intrigued when you were talking about breaking down the hierarchy for kind of how people learn by actually making the students do the work. I completely agree with that approach. Um, but also what I'm finding is that you have to uh, set up some sort of methodology for uh, allowing them to show their ability to do the work. So how do you set up the process of developing assignments <clears throat> and rubrics or whatever that would allow them to do that? So simply what to do is make sure everything I do is interactive. Everything I do is collaborative. Everything I do is done in teams to make sure if somebody is highly talented in one aspect, somebody else can learn from him. So given all of these, uh, you all know how to play bingo? And not being a Roman Catholic, I never learned how to play bingo. But bingo is a structure where you fill five spaces in a straight line. And you can have a bingo game to help people learn any subject you want. So one approach I'm using is what I call templates or what you call rubrics or what I call frames. And you can take a simple frame and you can make it into a wide variety. My secret is keep the structure intact, but to change the content. You use the same rubric and change, plug in new content, interesting content, and things of that nature. And which brings me to one of my favorite content. We have been talking about a lot of different things. Apparently, absolutely no structure. But here is what I want for you to do. I want you to tell me, based on what has been happening so far between Kurt and me and the other people, what is one important thing you learned so far in today's session? And this is what I want to do. We don't move on to the next activity or next part of today's session unless I have heard from at least five different people. So which five, it doesn't matter. And the only constraint is you like to say something based on what you learned today from this particular session, but you may not repeat something somebody already said. So the secret strategy is get over it as quickly as you can. What did you learn today so far? I want five people in any oh, order. Don't be, don't be polite. Don't raise your hand, just to yell out. Okay, so I think what I learned basically uh, from what you were just saying, uh, especially is to keep the structure consistent, but let the uh, content evolve. Um, and I think that's a very important quote to remember. Very good. One down, four more. Well, I would say that the power yeah. of a team is an, is, is uh, very valuable in, in learning. Uh, learning is social. So the process of getting a team and interact, it's you have... 60% already. Do everything in a team, no Teams. solitary confinement. Okay, two down, three more. I'll speak up. You, uh, you showed us the cards and said you every day ask yourself to test the assumptions that you're going into 
the day with or into any conversation with. So that was one thing. And then well, another thing that I noticed. Limit one per person, we will come back. Three down, two more. Tiagi, I like the fact that you mentioned that the only person who's learning was the instructional designer. <laughs> um, and yeah, yeah, we, we know about the, the power of social learning theories, but I think having your perspective of having crossed that um, cross the, 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 the threshold from behaviorism moving into the more um, cognitive and more social aspects of uh, perspectives of learning. Um, the, the fact that you you were there from from that um, from that behaviorist coming out from that behaviorist uh, era, it's really refreshing to hear that that you um, bucked the trend in your era. Thank you. Four down, one more to go. I can go. Um... So if we want change in an organization, it should come from upper management. Okay. So I will add. Oh, okay, go ahead. A summative thing, two things. One is, Tiagi mentioned bingo. I am Roman Catholic, so I know about these. My, aunt's a, my auntie's a nun, but um, ah. tomorrow, you all have a chance, those of you in Bloomington, to play bingo because the IST department has moved to the third floor. And one of the things they're doing at the open house tomorrow is having little known facts of the faculty in a mm. bingo game activity. So I can tell you my little known fact that I submit, no, I shouldn't tell you. Um, anyhow, you, you can find out more, uh, those of you, not all of you are in Bloomington, but anyways, you have a chance. I will also mention that if you've watched Tiagi's um, or, or listened to Tiagi over the, his career and or have attended any of his sessions, what he's doing right now is what he does better than me. But what I mean by that, and, and you all know my R2D2 method, read, reflect, display, and do. I got that reflect notion from this right now. Tiagi believes in debriefing. Debrief, debrief, debrief. Bonk didn't believe in it at all. I constantly was teaching something new and talking. I never debriefed until I started reading what's he, his writings and, and listening and watching him in action. So he's developed probably 100, maybe more ways to debrief. As many ideas as he's got of instructional strategies, he's got a, a debriefing idea. And that debriefing becomes an instructional strategy because when you put the emphasis on the learner, then it's the focus of the instructor or the instructional designer or the curriculum designer or the, the the, the, the trained department manager, the focus then becomes on reflection, on the debriefing on what those learners did so they can, the cognitive resin, residue can form internally and they can elaborate on what they did and the, and the cognitive structures form from the explanations of what they're doing or the elaborations of what they're doing. Um, they're internally in effect teaching each other what just happened and, and, and providing the explicitly on the social plane those ideas that occurred. So did I get some any of that right, Tiagi, about debriefing, or you want to talk to us about debriefing? Ah, you did great. And talking of debriefing, you learn. Oh. <laughs> okay, day six, 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 still <laughs> running. <laughs> One of the things I was looking for is there are certain things I wanted to communicate earlier in my random things. And I'm happy to report none of the things you reported as having the points that you picked up had nothing to do with what I wanted to get across. So, but what you got is valuable. What you got is useful. What you got is important. It is not what I want you to get, but what you got out of it. And that is the major thing. No training transaction is ever wasted. People learn if only 
not to come to your sessions anymore. So everything is a learning experience and it is not wasted. And you can take anything like what is happening today. And as Carter says, you can debrief, you can have people reflect. And we have seven people in the room. And does anybody remember who was the first person to respond to the earlier question, what did you learn from today's session? We, we had five people talk. Who was the first person who talked? The style person from... That would be... <laughs> yeah, that would be me. Congratulations. <laughs> Who wanted to keep on going, talking on and on and on? I had to cut her off. <laughs> Why did they do that? This is the Zygarnik effect. Can anybody guess what was she going to say before I stopped her from talking? Whoever guesses it correctly <coughs> will get $10. And you are the judge. You don't tell what you were going to say. Other people are going to guess what you were going to say in response to the question, what did you pick up? What did you learn from today's session so far? One of the interesting things people ask me is what if you ask a question and nobody responds? Fortunately, well, I'm well, I, I want the $10. So I'm going to say that Tiagi was teaching us about curiosity, holding up cards back to back and not, and not revealing the other side of the card. And, you know, and he owes me $10 if that was you, if that's what you're going to say next, Natasha. And all you have to say is yes right now and I get the $10. He no. will split it uh, and he will give you $5 if you lie. Yeah, you can lie and I give you the other five of that. I was going to say, you're changing my mind. <laughs> <laughs> I'm easily persuaded. <laughs> Actually, let's pretend you were thinking of something else. What were you going to say? What was I really going to say? Yeah. I was going to say that I, I found it very interesting that you talked about, you know, similarities in your careers and your professional experiences with Dr. Bonk, but in the end, it was you have similar philosophies that was the most profound. So I thought that was an important point for my takeaways. Wonderful. Yep. It is not the skills. It's not the knowledge. It is the philosophy which changes people or the mindset or whatever you want to call it. Uh, it's not that we wear glasses and we have red shirts and white shirts and try and look the same. <laughs> uh, okay, you ready? Let me try. Huh. Good. Everybody got a piece of paper? By the way, this is the cheapest Zoom approach I use. I don't even want to use the chat box or the breakout room or the whiteboard and all of those fancy things. Very simple thing. Everybody get a piece of paper. If you don't have a piece of paper, just pretend you have a piece of paper. And I'm going to give you a fill in the blank question. I'm going to ask you a question and I want you to come up with a one sentence answer. What makes virtual classroom, what makes webinars so boring? What makes webinars boring? And you can think of, I'm sure, hundreds of different responses, but I want you to write down only one response, the most important reasons why webinars are boring. 
And do you have 10 more seconds to finish your task? And I have asked this question of various groups around the various countries around the world. And here is a psychic task for you. You have written something that is good, that is your own unique point of view. Now I have done a content analysis of the responses I got from so many people. I want you to take a turn, make a prediction of what will be the most frequently given reason for boring webinars. Don't tell me, just think of it. And I'm going to give you the top five from the international collection of the content and whoever matches so many of these, the largest number of other people's items gets $10 from cult. Good. Okay, you ready? I'm going to tell you one of the frequent responses and if you just that if you made a prediction, that will be what will be a frequent response. Number one, the content is boring. Did you think of that? Good. You get $10 from Kurt. Ready, make another prediction or if you had a previously different prediction, that's good. Second reason why webinars are boring, oh good, <laughs> is technical glitches, technical problems. You suddenly have the audio drop dead or something else happens. If that was one of your predictions, you get another $10. Ready for the third one? The instructor projects a set of slides and reads the slides. Good. Kurt gets $10 from Kurt. Fourth reason, there is no interaction of any kind among the participants or between the participants and the instructor. Many of you are nodding your head. That's wonderful. You all get $10. <clears throat> and the fifth most frequent response is even when there is interaction, it is stupid interaction. An interaction like put a pin on the virtual map to show where you're coming from. Uh, what is the current temperature, things of that nature, which is totally irrelevant as far as the content is concerned. Good. This is a template, this is a rubric, this is a frame. It doesn't matter what you're teaching. Jennifer, what is one of the topics you teach? That I teach? Yeah. Make or, up something <laughs> you would like to teach, you teach, you taught. Um, human resource development or... Um, Wonderful. Okay. Wonderful. Jennifer starts her class. Hey, today's class is on human research development. When I say human research development, what does it mean to you? Can you take a piece of paper and write down you were one definition for human research development. Good. I have collected the answers to that question from 2,752 earlier people. And can you make a prediction of what will be the most popular, most frequently used prediction? 
it doesn't matter instead of you were talking you're forcing people to think you're forcing people to come up with ideas you're making them interact with the imaginary things so natasha what do you teach or what do you want to teach or what did you teach in your misspent youth i i in my misspent youth i i taught high school english wonderful great okay folks everybody listen carefully i'm going to tell you a very short story everybody heard the story i want you to come up with a title for this story and everybody write it secretly i have read this story for so many different people and asked them the same question can you predict what will be the most popular title for the story you heard and why do you think so so you got people talking thinking about it alternatively natasha says hey folks you are on a raft in the middle of a shark infested sea the raft yes has a leak and that is you got to get rid of one of the passengers you are all in the raft so can you make a single sentence statement why your life should be saved and we should push kurt of the raft as the first person and so you get the people talk you taught them instructional technology you ask people hey you listen to my semester long lecture on instructional technology process now of all of these things we taught you to do which one is the most important aspect important activity in it? so the basic idea doesn't matter what you teach you ask people questions tell them actually i was cheating tell them i collected the data from lots of other people can you guess can you make a prediction of what is going to be the most popular response to the question and in the process you got people thinking talking interacting predicting evaluating and doing things and this activity i have used it for 2000 different topics with 2000 different groups of people so that is my sneaky idea hey the end i have taken over 2 minutes beyond the allocated time and cut to say if you don't stop at 8 o'clock we will turn you into a pumpkin tiagi Um, yes, I won't turn you into a pumpkin if you can stay for a few more minutes with us because I have a question. Yes, sir. So my my question for you is, and my friend Sam Nadu's here, for, who is uh, the editor of Distance um, uh, Distance Learning uh, Journal uh, for the last twenty some years. Uh, but my question is, I wanted to ask you what your favorite technique is, and do you remember what the, your answer was? I don't know. So, I can't. So, So could you tell us about this technique and I'll tell you what it is. It's called Good. the top 3 activity. Could you tell everyone what how you do it? It's basically what you're doing. So Elaine is here who's got the tech variety book with me, chapter 3 of the uh, the the third principles curiosity. What you're doing here in making predictions is arousing curiosity constantly and reflection. And so, you know, you in in all that he's been doing the last 15 minutes is about curiosity question asking and reflection debriefing um that that end of things but tell us about top 3 what do you think is the answer to kurt's question <laughs> what do you think i will tell you anyone have a clue or a guess You, some of you been in the Saturday class. Sunmei's been in there. <laughs> Kung Wei's been in there. You know what top three is. Kung Wei. He's quiet. Okay. 
Kang Wei, we can't hear you. Kang Wei is typing something. Ah, or maybe our audio is not working, right? Uh, Sun Mei, do you remember what top three? <laughs> Sorry, I don't remember. <laughs> It was early morning on a Saturday morning in Stanford. It's 5 a.m. Oh, Kung Wei's mic doesn't work. Okay. Does anyone want to take a guess what top three means? What it would mean? Elaine, you probably should know what top three is. I'd say interactivity is the top one. Um, drawing from um, um, participants' funds of knowledge might be the second one. Um, and the third one would be uh, to draw from whatever, uh, consider the um, affordances of the different technologies or resources that you're going to make use of and apply them appropriately in your context. That would be my top three that I think that you might say. <laughs> okay. It's a smart answer, but I don't think uh, top three. Tiagi, you want to get back to top three? You tell me the top three. I'm getting senile. <laughs> okay, yeah, he's getting a little senile. So what, what he does in groups is he has people, so he has a number of techniques for summarizing. So he likes doing debriefing, question asking, and summarization. Because all three of those techniques, and he also likes getting things on paper, like a, a visual of what you've learned. Those are all ways to condense information, to elaborate and explain. In the top three, he has... Soon may put her top three things she got from today and Natasha her top three things she got from today. And he has them work in small teams in a breakout group to talk to about their each of their top three. And they have to come to three total between their six ideas. And then she then he has Soon May and Natasha work with Xia Jing and Priska in their group. They had six ideas. They got down to three. And so they share their three best ideas with Soon May's group and three best with Krista's group. And they have to come up with three. So they originally had 12 ideas. Now they've distilled them to three. And if he wants to go one more iteration, then he has a group of four with Jennifer, Sam, Edgar, and Kang Wei. And their top three ideas from 12. And the other group's top three ideas, they could them for three, the three best ones. So it's constantly thinking, reflecting, and debriefing, and getting people to come up with the three best. It's a great technique. I use it all the time, time permitting. Uh, I use it all the time. And one other technique that Tiagi likes is what's called a 99 second challenge. Tiagi, would you like to talk about how you use the 99 second challenge at conferences or at training events and what it is, or have people guess what it is? We could have them guess again. Um, does anyone want to take a guess what a 99 second challenge is before Tiagi tells us what it is? Elaine, you know this one. <laughs> hmm. Since I know the answer to that, okay, one of the things uh, in the annual conference of the International Society for Performance Improvement, it suddenly occurred to me that within any 90 minute presentation that is probably just 99 seconds worth of useful information. Everything else is unnecessary fringe information. So what we did was to say, we are going to have a session and we will have a lot of people making presentation. The only constraint is your presentation should be 99 seconds, within 99 seconds. And it could be any topic, it should be self-contained, it could be complete, it could be flexible, it could be primarily audio, you don't use all kinds of visuals, and things of that nature. So let us see who wants to be a scapegoat. Okay. Want to talk for 99 seconds. Can you 
respond. Can you explain what is the most important aspect? What's the title of uh, 511 cut? Instructional Technology Foundations. Instructional Technology Foundation. Good. Can you explain to me within 99 seconds what is Instructional Technology Foundation? The seconds are ticking at the bottom. Who wants to go first? Actually, let us torture you more. Everybody gets to answer the question. What is Instructional Technology Foundation? If you don't give your 99 seconds, less than 99 seconds answer, Kat will give his answer, I will give my answer, it will be boring. Priska is smiling. Priska, give it a shot. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I'm smiling because I really don't know, but I would say that um, Instructional Foundations is the study of learning how to uh, teach via standard um, educational models and understanding the process and evolution and the history of this profession. Good. Yep, it was within 99 seconds. Who else? Anyone else want to give it a, a, a crack at it? So Psalms, Tom wants to give it a crack. What's Instructional Technology Foundation, Psalm, in 99 seconds or less? I say that it's about optimizing human competence with the use of technology. Somebody should give him another doctorate. <laughs> <laughs> Even though he got his first one from Canada, we still excuse that. Um, <laughs> Uh, who else wants to give a shot? Uh, Natasha, you had your hand up. <laughs> you did. You did. Oh, no, I was clapping. I, oh, okay. I was clapping for that, that extra doctorate that was just earned. <laughs> <laughs> Jennifer, you want a second doctorate? Go ahead, Jennifer. I'll pass this one. Sorry. <laughs> Okay, any any brave souls? We haven't heard from Katie here for a while. Okay, so to me, the fundamental of instruction is not the behavior, not being busy. It is the focus is on outcome. So is your learner able to produce something concrete and useful. It doesn't matter how you make a person capable of producing something good and whatever you want to do, don't get hung up on. There is one right way to do it and just let it go. Good, that is. So, so today we're running out of time. I realized that um, but I want to mention that this technique can be used at conferences. You have 20 to 25 people in a row, and you can hear from the foremost authorities in a field in, in a matter of 45 minutes or 30 minutes. It's a great way to get young people in the field understanding what the different perspectives are. And the people who maybe have historically have, have played a huge role in it, they all can come at the first day before the conference starts or the night before the conference, before it even gets going. Tangi has all these famous people show up for this, this session, these kinds of sessions. Um, I have a question, two questions before we go, Tiagi. How have you seen the field change? In particular, what skills and competencies do you see required today as opposed to 30 or 20 or 40 years ago? What are the things people in this field are, are needing to learn or aspire, be curious about that, that, that's emerging, that these people in the class here might want to, um, to explore? What kinds of things? Okay. One of the things is <clears throat> people are into open-minded approach to doing 
to producing accomplishment on the part of the people. No longer it is behaviorism or cognitive psychology or informatics. It is whatever works. The focus is on what the outcome is. The second change is students are getting more and more militant. We used to tell people, shut up, you will understand it later when you grow up or something like that. Now people are challenging. The third change, Kurt, is people want training, education, teaching to be entertaining. The, the line between education and the entertainment is disappearing. People are no longer capable of withholding the skepticism and listening to somebody. And the other major change is the participants are becoming totally heterogeneous. No longer is it these or high school, eighth grade students, they all fit into this clone. No, everybody is different. Everybody who comes to R511 brings a very different background that is both a challenge and a wonderful opportunity. So Daddy, thank you for that. I mean, that's great to have as, as a reflection. Can you tell people how to get a hold of you um, and what your game? You've got a gaming um, gamification newsletter. Uh, does that still? Do you still have a newsletter? And how can people subscribe to it? How how can people keep in what what with what you're up to? How do people find out what your newest simulation is or your newest newsletter or blog and that things of that nature? I, uh, that's my final question. I'm not sure. If, Others do, but can you tell us more how they keep in contact with you? Anybody here is capable of multitasking on your computer while you're listening to me. Can you go type in this URL, tiagi at uh, tiagi.com, T H I A G I dot com. And the first person to be able to do it gets ten dollars from Chris. Cut. Anybody at tiagi.com? Oh, good. Congratulations. That is how you get hold of me. If you go there, there are probably something like four hundred different games and templates and rubrics and activities, and one of the uh, things I do is every day ever since March 21, 1984, each day I design a training activity. I design a training game. Holidays, weekends, whatever day, it doesn't matter. Every day I do it. And where do I do it? According to my wife, that is because I'm psychotic. So and these training activities and games, some of them I throw them away, some of them I publish it. And every month I have a newsletter called the Game Letter, and it contains some of the games which we came up with during that particular month. So you can just send me an email saying I want to receive announcements about your next newsletter or game letter, I will send it to you. If not, they are all archived in the website. So I think it is under game blog or something like that. If ah, anybody on my website and can you read the menu items on, is there one called the game blog? Can you click on game blog? What do you see Natasha under game blog? 
Sorry. Okay, now I'm unmuted. Yeah, so so what it looks like is that there are there's entry after entry after entry at different times that look like they're links to um, as you were describing these different games that have been created. Um, That's right. So it will say April, May, March, September, and so on. If you click on it, you will see that particular issue. So if you're too lazy to send me an email, you go there and each month you can click and read what is the latest set of games. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Kurt, for inviting me. And thank you all very much. By the way, here is a secret. I learned as much, if not more, than you did. The difference is, I'm told I'm the facilitator or the instructor, but I learn from you. You hopefully learn something from me. Thank you all very much. Have a nice evening. It's past my bedtime. Thank you, Tiagi. I am going to stop the recording and say big thank you all for this tonight. Thank, thank you, Thank you, Pat. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Natasha. Thank you, Tiagi. <laughs> thank you, Sam. And, and uh, Dr. Uh, uh,